Today, though, we are here for the Zoo Tea with presenter Janet Rosenthal. She was born in Detroit, and she's lived in the area for her whole life, I believe, yes. Um, she was a registered nurse, and she worked in cardiac and intensive care units. Her hobbies include travel, photography, and computers, which she's able to uh, combine with her love of animals and zoo visits. She started volunteering at the Detroit Zoo 16 years ago after a chance meeting with a Detroit Zoo docent, and she came up with this program in response to requests for zoo outreaches to senior centers and nursing homes. So please help me welcome Janet Rosenthal. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you for inviting me here. I really do appreciate it. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the zoo, uh, how it what used to be and how it is now. Um, the Detroit Zoo celebrates and saves wildlife. That's our byline. Um, in, in 1883, the zoo, and this I've heard two different stories. A circus either abandoned their animals in this building that was across from Old Tiger Stadium, or the zoo bought them. I'm not quite sure which one's true, but the people of Detroit got together and uh, bought food and started taking care of the animals. Unfortunately, that only lasted about a year. And then the animals sort of disappeared. Some of them were stolen, apparently. So now um, the zoo uh, is located at 10 miles in Woodward. That plot of land was bought by um, a lot of the city leaders for the zoo, and the zoo was um, uh, started at that location. The zoo is owned by the city of Detroit yet, and it is operated by the Detroit Zoological Society. That was the fundraising um, arm. And thanks to you and your fellow taxpayers of both uh, Oakland, Wayne, and Macomb County, uh, the zoo is able to continue on. And I noticed I was in your gift shop and I noticed you're selling some of the Puabic pottery things. I do, if you come to the zoo, I would like you to, when you go into our birdhouse, if you look up over the entrance door and, and the entrance into the butterfly, you're going to see these beautiful Puabic um, pottery peacocks that were made by Mary uh, J. Strait. Uh, the birdhouse was opened in uh, 1927. And this is a picture of it just before it opened. I remember going there as a child, and all the side cages had small, um, colorful little songbirds. And when I was a kid, I remember the eagles being in this uh, big dome. Other people tell me, no, it wasn't eagles. It was some, but right, you and I know it was eagles, right? OK. <laughs> um, this is an old postcard showing the uh, building. It looks pretty much the same now. But we now call it our Wildlife Interpretive Gallery. And when you go in there, you will see our uh, butterflies and our birds in there, free flight. We also have this new program there called Science on a Sphere. It's really quite interesting. A giant globe is hanging from the ceiling and uh, four projectors um, from each corner. Um, show films on it and, and uh, talking about very various things. Right now they're showing one about uh, the currents, uh, ocean currents. And we do have a bunch of children come in to see that. Sort of like you're in outer space and you're looking back at the world. The, one of the first animals at the zoo was wolverines and the first uh, logo did feature the wolverine. We did put our elephants to work when they arrived at the zoo. They, they did help haul things around, and this is in 1928, just before the zoo opened. They also uh, did uh, have animal, uh, people riding on their backs at times. Another exhibit that when we first opened were raccoons. Now you're going to say, why on earth would we want to show raccoons? Well, it was because we didn't have enough room, uh, animals for all the different exhibits when we opened. So they stuffed a couple of raccoons in one of them and said, here's an exhibit. Look at the animals. Now you just see them running around free when they come in to visit the zoo. Um, this is our tiger exhibit. It's pretty much the same, except we no longer have the uh, wet moat around it. There is a dry moat. Um, the Detroit Zoo was one of the first uh, zoos, actually the first zoo in North America to have barless exhibits. 
the polar bear exhibit was um, there, very popular. It was there when we first opened, and it would house as many as 17 bears. Um, the bears used to try, line up and beg for food from visitors. Um, and they could be seen very easily, but we found out later, bears don't like that kind of an exhibit. Bears need a lot of room, especially polar bears. Polar bears, remember, live on the top of the earth. There's not that much that's blocking their vision. So they didn't like having the walls behind them. So we've now got a new exhibit that I'll show you in a minute. Morris was a polar bear, and this is an interesting story. I'm sure you've probably heard it. Um, the day the zoo was officially open, the mayor of Detroit came to the zoo. He got lost in the parking lot, went in the wrong entrance, went in the back instead of the front where all the other people were there to welcome him. Um, a keeper had set down a basket of food that they were going to feed the polar bear for people's entertainment. The polar bear saw it and decided, I don't want to wait, I'm going to jump out. That's when we found out that moat wasn't quite wide enough. The, <laughs> po the polar bear leaped out. The mayor, being a politician, said, oh, he's come to greet me, and walked up with his hand out. For, just before the keepers were able to scoot the bear back out into the exhibit. <laughs> Then the bear exhibit was closed and the moat was made wider. Um, now in 2001, we had um, a gentleman come down from Nunavut in uh, Canada, and he carved this granite bear right on exhibit. This is made out of a, a huge piece of, of granite, and the bear's very tall. He, they're very spiritual people, and he had a vision of a male polar bear emerging from a den and sniffing around for food. So that's what he uh, carved for us. It now stands at the front of the exhibit. This is our new Arctic Ring of Life exhibit from 2001. And if you'll notice the globe there, it says north. And if you notice all the directions to the side, they're all south because everything's south when you get up on top of the world. Our polar bears um, can be seen sometimes swimming across the tunnel. We can't guarantee it if you're the world's uh, biggest land carnivore. You know, we're not going to be able to tell you what you have to do. You do what you want to do when you want to do it. We do try to encourage them, and you can often find them swimming. It is quite wonderful. Um, back in the olden days, at one point, the zoo got robbed. So the keeper, or the uh, director at that time thought, oh, well, I'm going to solve that problem. He started locking up the money and putting it in the lion's cage. <laughs> Didn't get robbed again. <laughs> Our lions um, have also had uh, a nice exhibit that has just recently been redone. It's now about a third of, of, the, of the original size larger than it was. The moats are gone so that it is um, surrounded by glass. People can get quite close up to see the lions, and the lions can get pretty close to the people, too. This, um, this beautiful male lion that I have here is Simba, and he just came to us from the country of Qatar. The royal prince there had been given a lion as a gift. And after about three years, he decided, yeah, maybe this isn't the best place for a lion. I'm going to look around and find the best place for my lion to live. And he selected the Detroit Zoo. He flew his lion over in his own private royal jet. How about that? Wouldn't you like to be a lion? <laughs> he had to go through customs in New York, and then he came to us, and he is now on exhibit. He's a young fellow. He's about four years old. Our females are both very old, so we do have a breeding recommendation for him, and we are going to be trying to get a younger female for him. Our rhinos um, are on exhibit, and if you may remember the uh, exhibit where the elephants used to be, was sort of divided in half so that we had a rhino on one half and the elephants on the other. Well, a few years ago, um, our director, Ron Kagan, uh, looked around and he said, you know, Detroit isn't the best place for an elephant to live. In the winter, we have to take them in. An elephant needs to walk from Detroit 
to Traverse City and back again every year. We couldn't exercise them properly. We had to keep them in about six months a year. So our elephants uh, retired and moved to California. One has since passed away. The other one's doing very well. We hear from her often. Um, the elephants way back in 1928 used to have people ride them. We, we offered elephant rides. And if you look really carefully, this one little boy in the upper exhibit has come back to the zoo as a volunteer. He was a docent, and now he is a gardener at the zoo. The rhinos now have the entire exhibit to themselves. Rhinos don't need the amount of space that elephants do, so it's working out really well. We have two male rhinos. They came to us right about the time the elephants left, and they came from two different zoos. Normally, zoos don't show male rhinos together. They don't get along, so it was a very long introduction for them. Now they're best buddies, and you just can't separate them. They're always together. I had a tour the other day, and we were on the tram, and I said, oh, well, the rhinos are coming to us, and they came galloping up to the edge. And I said, oh, isn't that nice? They came to side and I, They did a synchronized turn, so all of a sudden, we're looking at two rhino tails, and they just <laughs> stood there. So I think they were, were complaining about something. Apparently, they don't like the noise of the tram. Um, children still come to the zoo often to take, uh, to take photos, and here's some children in 1938 with their little box cameras. Now when they come, they bring their digital cameras, their phones, but they're still taking pictures and still having a great time at the zoo. The Rackham Fountain was um, built in 1939. Um, Mrs. Horace Rackham um, had it built after her husband passed away. He had been our first commissioner at the zoo. And so that Rackham Fountain is there, and it is probably one of our most photographed landmarks in the zoo. We think everybody in the entire world who's ever been to the Detroit Zoo, someplace in a shoebox in their closet, has a picture of themselves in front of that fountain. <laughs> you do? <laughs> the zoo keys, now this one I'm going to have to update a little bit, but the old zoo key is the elephant. That's what we used to have. And then we got the new zoo key. But now we're even more modern. Now we have an app for your smartphone, and you just have to hold it up, one of those funny little square things. I don't have a smartphone, so I've not done it, but uh, apparently you hold it up to that and, and push something, and it, it tells you about the animal that's in the exhibit. Um, the auto entrance was uh, redone in 1936, and now we have it uh, that we have a big... Um, enclosed parking area right in front of the zoo on the Woodward thing. We just heard that there, we are now exploring covering part of the regular parking lot with solar panels to um, reduce the cost of electricity to us. We're, we're doing a lot of things to become more green. So this was the entrance in 1966. After the expressway went through, we did lose some land from a parking lot to it. Um, they gave us money to rebuild the entrance. And if you'll, you know how the expressway is down below the zoo, a lot of that dirt that was taken out, we actually got and were able to use uh, around the zoo to build mounds and stuff for our animals to be on. In 1987, our entrance looked like this. The um, uh, water tower that's out there was originally built in 1928, one and a half million gallons of water. Um, and it, it brought up the water pressure in the communities all around the zoo. Um, now it just serves as a landmark and basically um, a, a wonderful sign for people to uh, see so that they know that they're, they are approaching the zoo. This is our front gate, and many of you may remember the little uh, hippo that's up here, the stone hippo. It was originally in Northland um, in the shopping center. I remember going there as a young woman and seeing it there. This is our baboon rock, and it looks much the same now, except we don't have baboons in there. We do have snow monkeys, which are from Japan. And the snow monkeys love water. 
So in, in Japan, they have learned to go in the hot mineral springs that are located up in the mountains where they live um, during the cold, cold winter. So we gave them a hot tub. No, yeah, why not? Who's the first guys to actually go and swim? The little boys. I mean, you had to know it, right? Um, some of the others, I've watched them, and when they get something we call primate shower, which is sort of like a dog biscuit. They'll drop it in that hot water, pick it out, taste it with their teeth, mm, not quite tender enough, drop it back in to finish cooking. <laughs> so they're really clever. They're, they teach the, these behaviors to each other, too, so that most of them uh, will go in and swim. The mini railroad stills at the zoo it was opened in 1931, donated by the uh, Detroit News. It has been upgraded a bit. Um, the train stations in the 30s and the 60s were around the zoo. Now the train runs from the front of the zoo, from the main station to the back to the African station. And we have completely rebuilt engines that Chrysler donated. And now, for the comfort of the engineer, there is some sort of air conditioning. It's sort of open, so it must just be a fan that sort of blows them because the heat of the engine was really very difficult on the conductors. Oops. Wait a second. There we go. The farmyard um, in 1932. And the farmyard today, it looks pretty much the same. We do have some. Um, cattle, a yak in there, we've got some goats, we've got some pigs, and we have these two gorgeous horses. These were thoroughbred race horses that retired from racing. Uh, when you're a racehorse and you retire for racing, there's not much of an opportunity for you to do anything else. So um, a group called Cantor um, adopted them, and we took uh, first Buster, the darker one, in, um, and then uh, we later on, um, a person uh, adopted Trio, this lighter colored one, and she unfortunately lost her job right after adopting a horse, so she couldn't afford to feed it, so she gave it back to Cantor, who asked us if we wanted it, and we said, sure, Buster needs a buddy. So they are running around, and they will be with us the rest of their lives in our barnyard. How many of you remember these scenes? Yeah. <laughs> This was a lot of fun back in 1955, but now we've really come full swing around and realized that it's really not nice for the animals to have to dress up and act like people. They're not supposed to be here really for our entertainment. We do need to share the world with them. Joe Mendy was our most popular one, and you can see Joe's got a bottle of whiskey. Apparently, the former director back in those days used to go and have a shot with Joe every morning. <laughs> Now, um, in 1989, we opened our exhibit called The Great uh, Apes of Harambe, and Jane Goodall actually came to us and uh, cut the ribbons for the opening. Uh, it started out just a chimp exhibit. This is one of our chimps with a baby. That baby is still with us. She's, um, this is our little boy. He's about four now. He has a younger sister who's about two. And uh, very unusual for a mother to have two babies that close together. She's not in the wild. She doesn't have to protect it as much because she is in a protected situation at the zoo. The gorillas used to be housed in a, in a house where they had some toys that were more for humans than gorillas. Now they also have been added to the Great Ape, Apes of Harambe in 1996, so they have, that exhibit um, occupies four acres, so that they have half of it and the chimps have half of it, that they can get out and really enjoy themselves in the sunshine. Uh, instead of riding elephants now, we do uh, offer um, a carousel. This was just opened last year. Um, for children to ride, there's a bunch of uh, different exotic animals that have been adopted and funded by uh, various people. You can see the little plaque on the animal when you ride it. It's been real, very popular. The kids really do enjoy it. Trackless train drove around the zoo starting in 1949. We uh, used to charge a small amount and people could, could ride because they felt that the zoo was too long to walk. Unfortunately, because of the crowds now, we can't do that every day. So 
we do offer it for rent so that there are uh, various groups that will come. And um, sometimes, uh, yesterday was senior day at the zoo. I wasn't there, but apparently it wasn't real successful because of the darn weather. But the tr trams were offered and the seniors did a, a quick little 20 minute overview ride around the zoo, all for free. The, the uh, senior citizen, their caregiver, the parking was all covered. Do you remember Sonny Elliott coming to the zoo? I remember watching the show when I was a kid. I just loved it. Um, it was the longest running uh, zoo-oriented TV show on TV. It lasted for 17 years. Sonny Elliott actually has one of our films that's at the zoo. We have several films, and he did narrate it. Uh, the Holden Museum of Living Reptiles was added in 1960. The name has just been changed now to the Holden Reptile Conservation Center, which is also reflecting our new attitude about conservation. When this building was built, it was light and airy, very much unlike most reptile buildings, which were sort of dark, gloomy, and a little bit scary for people to go into. Um, we do still get people who are afraid of snakes and don't want to go in, but if you walk in the building, it's sort of a U-shaped building. If you walk in, if you keep your eyes to the left, you'll never see a snake. In, in the center are our, our crocodiles, our caimans, several turtles, our alligators, but the snakes are all around on the outside. When I first came to the zoo 16 years ago, I was terrified of snakes. I, I wouldn't go in. When my kids were little, I'd say, honey, I'm going to sit on the bench. You go in. But mom, there are frogs in there. And I said, well, say hi to them. I, I, I can't go in. Now I realize snakes do have a very important part here in the world. They eat a lot of things that we don't like, like rats and mice that the farmers might find eating their grain, um, a lot of bugs. So they aren't so bad. And a couple of years ago, I was walking with my husband in Nature Trail, and a little snake slithered. And I said, oh, isn't he cute? And he said, what have you done with my wife? <laughs> <laughs> this is the outside of the building, and this is um, a sculpture of a turtle that the kids just love to death. And you can see, I don't know if you can tell really in this picture, his head is all shiny and gold from the children rubbing it. Um, they love getting their pictures taken on it, climbing up on him. The pteranodon is um, out there. It was uh, an animal that flew around at the same time the dinosaurs walked the earth. We've now put a, a boardwalk between our National Amphibian Conservation Center and our Holden Reptile Conservation Center. This was just added last year. And the marvelous thing about it is, although we call it a boardwalk, it's made out of plastic. It's recycled plastic. So I like telling kids, we may be walking on something that was uh, serving you milk a few years ago. <laughs> this is our National Amphibian Conservation Center. This is where our uh, frogs and our newts and our salamanders all live. When you go in, the first thing that you'll see is this beautiful, beautiful tile work that's done by Gretchen Cramp, a local artist. She always adds some little thing that you have to search for. In this case, she added a five-legged frog. And five-legged frogs, although they are a mutation, they are not too uncommon. Some frogs lay 10,000 eggs at a time. So if you lay 10,000 eggs, maybe a couple of them have problems. So. <laughs> this is inside the building and some of our, our beautiful frogs that we have in there. This little golden one um, is the world's most poisonous animal. Snakes are venomous. Um, that means they inject, when they bite, they inject the poison into their victim. Frogs are poisonous. That means they exude a poison that has to be ingested by whatever is attacking them. So this little guy, and he's probably, I don't know, maybe, what, two inches tall, has enough poison in his body to kill ten men. Um, this is our grizzly bear den, and this is um, pretty much how it, it still looks to this day. Um, we do have several grizzly bears. Some of our grizzly bears have been 
rescued. Two of them used to live in a national park. People thought it would be fun to drive through and feed the marshmallows and bread. All of a sudden, the grizzly said, people equal food. I will go to the people. I will rip their tent to pieces and eat their food. So the bears are caught up by the rangers. The third time they're caught up, they either have to be put down or they find a place like the Detroit Zoo, which is very good at rescuing animals and saving them from destruction. These three little guys, and I don't know if you've been to the zoo recently, these little guys are now about two. They came to our zoo last year after their mother was killed by a poacher in Alaska. It was funny because we had decided our, our grizzlies were getting old and we had put out you know, on, on the website that um, for animal availability that we were looking for grizzlies. About a week later, we got a call from uh, the Alaska Zoo saying, we've got three little grizzlies, do you want them? We said, sure. They FedExed them right down to us. So <laughs> it took us a little while. They, they had to be reacclimated to, to the situation, but they are absolutely adorable still and just very, very playful. Three little boys. The Penguinarium was designed in 1968 and opened at that time. Um, this is how it looks now. This is where the kids can get in, look in the windows and see the penguins. It's, we have three different species of penguins that are in there, the rockhopper, the macaroni, and the king. And the way the building's designed, the, the penguins can swim around in a circle and the kids can see them. One of the, the newest things we're going to be doing is we're going to be building a new penguinarium. Our penguinarium was the first one um, to be built for penguins uh, only. Our new penguinarium is going to be bigger, better, more fun, more interactive. It's going to cost a lot of money, though. So if you have a few millions sitting around you don't know what to do with it, you can donate to the zoo, and they'd be happy to help build the penguinarium. People often ask how the animals get to the zoo, and like I say, the, the one came by private jet, one by FedEx. Here's, in 1968, a giraffe that was trucked. Now they wouldn't be trucked in an open crate like this. They would be in a specially built enclosed crate, uh, crate because going down the freeways, you don't want them to get hit with rocks and stuff that would be coming off of the other vehicles. Our um, giraffe exhibit looks pretty much uh, the same as it used to. We have the um, Greek motif, uh, the, the um, I'm sorry, the Egyptian motif, that's what I meant to say, on the exhibit because way back some princess whose name is so long I can't pronounce it, um, just heard about this beautiful animal with a long neck. So she sent her men down the Nile to bring her back one. They brought her back a giraffe, and they told her about all these other wonderful, marvelous animals they found in Africa. So she said, oh, go and get me some of those, too. So they did, and she had, had them in the palace courtyard. Then all of a sudden, she realized everybody should see them. So that was how the first zoo came into being. So this is our little homage to them. Um, there you can see them. We frequently have to repaint them, but they're still there. We've added just recently a feeding station in which people pay $5 for a biscuit. They come up on the platform and they get to feed the giraffe. Unfortunately, we can't pet the giraffe because they're a very skittish animal, but we can feed them and we can feel that beautiful long purple tongue, 18 inches, wrapping around your hand to get that cracker out. <laughs> You haven't been slimed till you've been slimed by a giraffe. It's great. Our kangaroos um, have also expanded their exhibit. We used to have to look at them from outside, sort of above and over a fence. Now we actually can walk right in with the kangaroos. And we've got a female here with a joey in her pouch. Right now, all our joeys are, are bigger, and we don't have any in the pouch that we know of. But when a, a, a kangaroo is born, it's about an inch long. Very little guy, so he, has, he or she has to make its way all the way up across mommy's tummy into her pouch, because only the, the females have pouches. 
and where it attaches the nipple and stays for approximately six months. So it's possible that uh, some of our, our uh, mothers may have babies in the pouches right now. New animals that came to us in 2011 were the bush dogs, and they had been at the zoo approximately 45 years ago. Now we have a new pair of uh, females that are running around, and the African press, uh, crested porcupine is also back with us. Uh, the porcupine is a nocturnal animal, so sometimes it's sort of hard to see. But the zoo in the summertime is open on Wednesday nights till 8 o'clock, and that's the best time to come and, and look for the porcupine. Um, last year, we got uh, two greater elands. They're a beautiful a brother and a sister pair. Zoos have to be very, very careful about breeding animals. Um, this pair, obviously, since they're related, would never be bred to each other. So uh, we have, um, I call it a computer dating service, out of Minnesota. And they have all the animals registered, especially the SSP, the Species Survival Plan animals. And they tell us which male and which female uh, would make the best parents and the best genetic mixture. So then often we'll have to send an animal out or another zoo will send an animal in for breeding purposes. Coming attractions, um, we are going to be getting beavers this year. The beavers exhibit is um, being built uh, right near the otter exhibit. We already have the female beaver. She's in um, quarantine at the hospital. Anytime a new animal comes to the zoo, it has to be quarantined for at least 30 days, sometimes longer, to make sure they're healthy. Even though they came from another zoo and they were healthy there, there might have been some sort of a, a bug that they're bringing with them that they, those animals had learned to tolerate, but our animals couldn't. So she's in uh, quarantine. Guess what her name is? June Cleaver. <laughs> yeah. They're talking about when the male comes, changing his name to Ward, but we haven't really heard that. <laughs> one of our, one of our um, gentlemen at the zoo suggested Justin Beaver, too, for the kids, for the teenagers to like. Um, the new penguinarium is going to be built um, right over in this area. So here's the old penguinarium here, so it's going to be on the other side of the zoo sort of near the uh, Wildlife Interpretive Gallery, the birdhouse. The beavers, you can see, they've already put them on the map. They're right across, and they'll be abutting the woodland, uh, the uh, wetlands, right across from the otters. It's going to be an interesting exhibit, and it's hard to tell with just seeing the construction what it'll exactly look like, but it will be uh, something you'll be able to go down and see into the beaver dam. Um, I got most of this information from these two books, the first 50 years, and then this one was uh, done up for the 75th year. This one is still for, for sale at the zoo gift shop. So that's about all. I'm open for questions. I've also brought what we call biofacts, and these are some of the things we take around to show the children. We never travel with uh, live animals. It's not good for the animal. Um, think about, kids often ask if they can pet our animals or if they can feed them. They're all on special diets that we know will keep them healthy, so we don't want them getting anything else. We don't want people throwing things in the exhibit because who knows what they'll throw in. Um, so that, and patting, I tell the kids, okay, now somebody came and patted you on the head, and then 3,000 other people came and patted you on the head, some really hard and some very delicately. Would you like that? And most of the kids agree that no, that wouldn't be good. So we don't do that with our animals too. So we do have these pretty nice puppets. And I noticed you sell uh, the little finger puppets from Folk Manus Company in your gift shop. And this is one of the bigger guys. And they are pretty fabulous. We also have some skulls. These are not real. This is a plastic replica of a wild dog um, that we have and, and we can use for teaching purposes. We get it from a wonderful company called Skulls Unlimited. <laughs> um, these are real horns from an animal who used to re uh, reside in the zoo and this is a real antler. 
and we talked to the kids about how horns are permanent. Should one break off, this guy's never going to be able, would never be able to grow one back. It's covered with, the bone is covered with the sheet. And I just broke this this morning, so I thought I would try to incorporate it in my talk. Just going on TV, you say. <laughs> Antlers, on the other hand, are what deer have. Um, they fall off every single year. So right now, our fallow deer have not yet lost their antlers. They should be losing them any time now. The elk has lost his elk, uh, antlers, and you're just starting to see a bud come on his head. Every year, they're bigger and better than they were the year before. This egg is from an emu. And yep, this is the natural color. This bright dark green. So I, I tell the kids, wouldn't it be great if the Easter Bunny could just use these eggs and have to dye them? I also have um, a peacock feather and the peacock feather is really interesting. Uh, right now all our peacocks, most of our males do have these long tail show, uh, showy feathers. Every feather only has one eye spot. So when you see that peacock with dozens and dozens of eye spots, so, so that's how many feathers he's got. After breeding season, these will be dropping off, and you'll find them all over the zoo come about August. This is a, a zebra skin, and this pelt, um, if you look at it carefully, and you're all welcome to come up later and look at it, it's like a dark chocolate brown and white. They're not black and white like we've always learned. They're <coughs> like a dark chocolate. When the babies are born, it's actually a lighter brown. I've got the chimp holding, one of my favorite things, and it's the snake skeleton. Because it's amazing how many people think a snake like a worm doesn't have a skeleton. It does. It keeps growing and growing. All these are ribs. So just this little teeny end is the tail. And this is um, the shed <coughs> from a snake. It's not snake skin. Snake skin is when somebody has killed a snake and peeled the skin off to make a pair of boots, a belt, a hat, a band. Snake shed is what the snake sheds as he grows and he needs a bigger outfit to wear. And then this is one of my favorite puppets because I love the chimps. And, uh, the, the, the kids really like him too. We, we try to bring him out every time we grow because he, he's so interesting and we can point out that his hands have the opposable thumbs. That's to his feet, so he's a very, very good climber. <laughs> so that's about it. I did bring some um, uh, little brochures here about membership. I tell everybody, if you want to come to the Zoo more than twice a year, become a member. It's economical. It saves you. There's all sorts of different uh, types of membership uh, that are available now. I wanted to bring other pamphlets, but we're now practically all internet because I told you we're trying to, to be green. Our um, Arctic Food Court has recently been declared a green restaurant. Everything in there uh, uh, is going to dissolve and go back and uh, not be part of the landfill. And so I, I, they did print me off some of the internet papers about pavers and these are um, stones that you can have carved in your throat the zoo and not the waterway. So we're here if anybody would like one. So, do we have any questions about the zoo? Yeah? I have a question. Um, I'm part of a group that reads stories to kids in Detroit. We read from a book called Zoo Borns. And it had a picture of an artist <coughs> named Amani that was <laughs> as being from Detroit. So I want to know if Amani's still there. Because we've been telling children that he has moved there. on. Uh, There's been a couple babies since that. But this one's interesting because I do some volunteer work at the veterinary hospital. I saw Monty when he was 10 hours old. And he was absolutely adorable. The picture in the book is adorable. His ears are like yes. as big as his head. It's really cute. Yeah, our dogs really have big ears. Yeah. Okay. Yes? What is the size of the zoo? 125 acres. So uh, it's pretty big. Yes? What are the plans for the um, penguin area once the penguins leave for the new facility? We're hearing different things, and my husband told me last night, oh, I heard bats are going in there. And I said, well, we've heard bats. 
We've heard insects. We've heard just plain nocturnal exhibit. We won't know until it happens. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring today to show you were the plans for the new penguinarium, but because we haven't got the money and you know we don't know how far off that penguinarium is, those plans could change a heck of a lot. Because when we first got the amphibian center, we saw the original plans, and then when we it was built, it was not totally different, but quite different. So they asked me not to to bring them and show share them with you. Yes? I have one other question. This is probably like a trivial pursuit question. Are zebras chocolate on white or white on chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> People have never really said, they've never actually come up with an answer to that. Although I understand there is a wild animal park down near um, Toledo that has an all white zebra. So that makes me think that maybe the, you know, the brown stripes are, are the stripes and the white is natural. There's all sorts of, of really cute little African folklore about that too, about how the zebra didn't feel like getting up the day had passed out something. So when he finally got up, he was still wearing his pajamas, so that's what he's wearing. <laughs> we have a lot of our signage, we'll, we'll have those cute little stories about the animals. Yeah. You mentioned about the time, the before and after of the tiger exhibit and the lion exhibit. The one had a, a moat, but it's dry now and not water. And the lions don't have a moat anymore. Why is that? Especially well, tigers like water. Um, actually, tigers like water. Tigers actually swim in water, but um, the, the water moats are pretty much all gone from the zoo now. It used to be they thought it was a barrier to, yeah. for the animals to, uh, so they wouldn't escape. Now what we've done is the moat, and especially at the tiger exhibit, if you look at the moat, you look at the width of the moat, you look at how tall and straight the sides of the walls are, the tiger can't jump that far, can't jump that high. Um, a few years so ago... So if they got in the moat, they wouldn't be able to get back out? No, they can get out. They, they often will go down in the moat. But it's dry. It's so dry. That's why I was asking why it's now dry when it used to be wet at one time. Uh, they just decided to drain it. For one thing, you know, anything wet like that, the water will get stagnant. Yeah. Um, we did have a lot of, uh, of frogs and turtles that uh, live in, in all the water. When, when they drained the moat from the chimp exhibit, um, they had to uh, rescue and move a whole bunch of frogs and turtles that just were there naturally. Um, so they're just trying to get, get away from that. I think it was probably difficult cleaning too. And with the, the lions, uh, getting rid of the moat gave them so much more space. And in the exhibit, when you come to the zoo, you're going to notice there's two pieces of like venite that come out and seem to come out into the public area. <coughs> On the lion side, that venite is heated um, so that in the winter, the lion's going to want to lay next to the glass and people can really see them. Anything else? Okay, well thank you for having me, I appreciate it. Thank you.